Well, thanks for tuning in. And uh, let me begin by wishing you a very happy Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving is tomorrow. Today's Wednesday. Uh, likely will not be posting over the next couple of days and uh, be enjoying some time with my family and uh, who I'm very, very thankful for. Hopefully you've got some uh, friends or family you can spend some time with over these days as well. Uh, God has certainly given us much to be thankful for, and it's a great day to remember that. We should always be very thankful, obviously. But that being said, Thanksgiving Day is a wonderful opportunity to sort of stop and just be grateful for the blessings that God has given. Um, not only that, but uh, Thanksgiving, is my, uh, Thanksgiving is my favorite food holiday, so I fully intend to OD on tryptophan. Hopefully you will do the same. So, all right, well, thanks for joining in. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a good question. You know, uh, typically we would, uh, you know, on our Sunday morning and Wednesday nights, uh, we approach uh, those services with an expositional mindset. We take the Word of God and we make our way through it verse by verse, line upon line, and we spend time uh, digging into the Scripture that way. Uh, so the podcast that we do here is kind of a nice peripheral uh, outreach that allows me to go ahead and uh, answer questions that are more specific in different areas. And uh, this question is one of the reminders of why I enjoy sort of having this extra outlet to uh, to explore things in, uh, because this one is, uh, it has uh, it touches on biblical things in regard to the, the Antichrist system that will come into place one day, but it is a little bit on the periphery of what we might normally talk about. So let me take this question and see if we can't uh, uh, speak to it a little bit. This came in from Jure on Telegram. Uh, I just heard a podcast on AGI or artificial general intelligence, and the next one in line is ASI or artificial superintelligence. And the conversation went on to say that it will be the end of free will. Please speak on this in a deep dive, uh, Jure. Well, Jure, thanks for the question. Again, this is uh, uh, a little more specific in, in a particular direction than we might uh, sometimes go into, but being the nerd that I am, uh, this is an area that I find fascinating. Uh, on a number of levels. Number one, the discussion of free will. This, of course, from a biblical standpoint, is, uh, is a question that has been debated and discussed over the centuries, and it's one that we wrestle with in, in terms of uh, our own volition that God has given us inside of the, the framework of God's sovereignty as the king of the universe, the creator, and all. And so this is not an unfamiliar kind of a discussion for believers to engage in from a biblical perspective. But it's also, uh, interestingly, a topic that has uh, captivated philosophical and scientific communities as well. Are we in fact free at all or are we determined? That question has found its way into pop culture phenomenon movies and books and different ideas. And so it's a very contemporary discussion. Uh, in regard to the question of artificial intelligence, this is, uh, again, a real technical kind of a field, but it's one that is pervading everyday life for all of us on some level. Um, uh, let me just give a brief breakdown. I'm not an expert in this, but uh, I am nerdy enough and have looked into it where I think I can speak to it reasonably fairly and intelligently. So let me just kind of throw a couple of ideas out here just to uh, begin to break into this a little bit. Uh, there are increasing degrees of what are known as artificial intelligence. The, the most basic that you and I would generally engage with regularly would be just standard artificial intelligence, something like Siri or something like uh, uh, the AI that beat uh, Gary Kasparov in chess, uh, beat the ch chess champion and that kind of thing. That kind of AI is fascinating and, and, uh, and useful in, in, in many respects, but it effectively is the kind of uh, artificial intelligence that basically does a thing really well. Uh, the the uh, the artificial intelligence that was involved in uh, the programming that beat Gary Kasparov, for example, in chess, uh, it was phenomenally adept at at moving and counter moving and 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 all of the various kind of thinkings involved in um, in playing chess. But that's all it could do. It couldn't do ult other things. It couldn't then move on and make a cake for you or something. Uh, so that's that's kind of a, a basic idea of what artificial intelligence at that level is. The next thing, and really what's on the horizon currently, is what's called artificial general intelligence. This now becomes something that is much more like us. As a matter of fact, generally speaking, artificial general intelligence will be considered to have been achieved when you can no longer tell the difference between artificial intelligence and a human being in regard to interactions or even in some respects abilities. Um, some of you might be familiar with Alan Turing 
um, uh, uh, he was featured in a, a film in regard to the work that he's best known as uh, in terms of a code breaker in World War II. Um, but, uh, but Alan Turing actually could be considered as much as anybody the father of modern computing uh, and, and, uh, and, and was involved in, uh, in, a, in a lot of endeavors. But one of the side issues that he was involved in was what we now would consider to be sort of foundational in the thinking of artificial uh, general intelligence. And he basically put forth the idea that, uh, and this becomes the basis of the Turing test, if you could be on a, uh, in some kind of an engagement with a computer and there came a point when you could no longer tell whether you were interacting with a person on the other end of the line, if you will, or whether you were interacting with a computer, then for all practical intents and purposes, this computer would be human-like enough or would think, quote unquote, well enough to where it'd be indistinguishable from a person. And so since that time, there has been this uh, sort of um, move toward trying to create uh, uh, artificial general intelligence, something that would become human-like enough in its thinking, and again, potentially in its capacities, its abilities, uh, to where it would be indistinguishable for, uh, from a human being. So uh, since that time, there have been yearly like uh, uh, conventions uh, where they have competitions about which AI is closer to passing the Turing test and all that. The challenge with that is that on the one hand, on one level, you could interact with a computer and not realize that you're talking to a computer. You might think you're talking to a person. Uh, Google famously in the last few years put together as part of their, uh, um, their Google AI, uh, the ability for Google to answer your, your mobile device for you when a call comes in and to interact on your behalf as though that person on the other line were talking to you. It's starting to develop that kind of thing. Uh, that's very much in line with the whole Turing test kind of thinking. And so um, another example of that today would be like the, uh, you know, the various robotic uh, setups and AI um, uh, operates, operating, you know, robotic kinds of things that, um, that can move and make, you know, like uh, Elon Musk had his thing recently where he had a Tesla event. Uh, where he also then uh, released, I believe it was Optimus, I think it was called. There's a number of them out there, and I think his was Optimus. Uh, the idea of, of they'd be mixing drinks at the bar at this thing and, and, and just these amazing things that these robots that were sort of driven by a version of AI could do. But again, those AI can only still do a limited number of things. What would, what would be really the crowning jewel of artificial general intelligence would be when an AI, say a, say a robot again, a humanoid robot with an AI inside of it that could not only mix drinks at the bar at the convention, but then go on to play a game of chess and then go on to uh, go to the grocery store and, and go shopping and then tell a joke and then uh, uh, walk the dog and, and you know just sort of function in daily life in any number of the thousand plus, you know, thousands of interactions that you and I might engage with as, in, as human beings and to do so seamlessly as though it were human. Um, that would be, at that point, you would now be, if not cross the threshold, you'd be on the threshold of, of the realization of artificial general intelligence. General speaking of the broad swath of things that you and I can do that as of yet AI can't do. ChatGPT, for example, is an interactive kind of a thing that is crossing the line or blurring the lines in regard to um, you know, what appears to be human thinking or machine thinking. Now, all of this is built upon, by the way, what's called language models and large language models, the ability of tremendous amounts of data to be synthesized uh, in an AI modal that, that um, I think I'm using that word correctly, but the idea of, uh, of an AI being able to synthesize all of this data and be able to, um, with tremendous computing power, be able to interact not only in terms of content, but in terms of speed of interaction. Uh, it's really becoming quite impressive. Um, you know, for people, uh, if you're like me and you grew up watching like Star Trek and that kind of stuff, the idea of, of computer systems on starships that can function and interact and make decisions and create uh, warp fields and, and shields around ships to, you know, as they go into battle or as they travel at, at uh, you know, uh, multiple times the speed of light and all that kind of thing. 
um, things like this begin to open up your mind to, wow, you know, um, could these things really be possible? As a matter of fact, the El Kubier warp drive is a theoretical answer to the question or provides the potential answer to the question of can, um, uh, can mankind ever travel at superluminal speeds and those kinds of things. And so AI may provide the ability to solve the equations that are necessary to make that possible. Or, you know, on, on more common ground, um, AI is now being looked at as, as potentially a means by which we might solve global problems and things like that. So there could be tremendous advancement in things like medical fields or, you know, nowadays they talk about climate and all that kind of stuff. And so anyway, that's, that's why a, um, um, sort of at least being familiar a little bit with this concept of artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence uh, becomes kind of meaningful for us because all of us are either interacting directly with it or are beginning to interact at least indirectly with it. Um, you know, one sort of, um, um, you know, real life example of this might be uh, for, for a while when ChatGPT first came out, um, students were sometimes writing papers and handing them in as though they'd written them themselves. And so now there's actually software that, uh, uh, that has been developed to tell whether or not an AI did that paper or a human did that paper. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, matter of fact, as, as a personal example, um, last summer I had a chance to go down to Guatemala. We support a mission down there. And I had a chance to do an apologetics class at a Bible uh, Institute down there uh, by one of the Calvary chapels down in Antigua. And um, I didn't do this before I went, but when I came home, uh, I, I promise you I didn't do this, um, but I, I put together my curriculum and the syllabus and all the stuff for that class. Well, when I came home, I hopped on ChatGPT and I said, put together a syllabus for an apologetics class. And I, I might have had a little more specificity to, to it than that, but it came up with a syllabus for an apologetics class that was eerily similar to what I had put together, including reference works of ex external works, you know, reference works on a list, some of which I included in mine. And so uh, I was, uh, you know, just, it was pretty impressive to say the least, but of course the implications of that are interesting, if not maybe even staggering in some, uh, in, at some level. So. Anyway, so the idea of interacting with artificial intelligence, again, we've got an Apple Watch, I've got an iPhone. Uh, if you're a, an Android person, you've probably, you might be using Gemini on your, uh, on your thing now. Apple, I don't have an iPhone 16, but the new iPhones come with Apple intelligence and all that, and so, which is an artificial intelligence uh, entrance uh, way into that. So, um, so it's something that's not going away. And one of the reasons and one of the concerns about the question of whether or not it's ever going to go away, it, it won't. But the, the question that arises out of that then is, will artificial intelligence become, quote unquote, intelligent enough to get out of our ability to control it or to curtail it if it starts to go in directions that are not necessarily, um, you know, helpful for us? Right now, artificial intelligence can be very helpful for us. It can be a great tool to sort of utilize in problem solving or any of those kind of things. As a matter of fact, your Apple Mail right now, you can highlight a section, you can click and decide if you wanted to sort of reword it for you in a friendlier way or uh, that kind of thing. So it's, it's becoming a very, very normative part of the human experience uh, in, 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 uh, in, in pretty much any developed part of the world. Um, and again, in an indirect way, AI will likely have a direct impact on even non-developed or underdeveloped parts of the world in regard to decision making, technologies, processes, things like that. So this is a huge, huge, huge field, not only in terms of its scope, but in terms of the scope of its impact. So artificial general intelligence has not been achieved yet, but it is, it is sort of like the holy grail right now. It's what, it's what uh, all of these various companies are after. Um, in regard to their 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 pursuits, and so, um, um, but one day it will likely be achieved, and when it is achieved, what it will ultimately have accomplished is it will be able to again in quotes think like a person can. It will have achieved an equal level of thinking, if not even a faster, uh, slightly greater way of thinking. Um, and so, uh, again, much could be said. And I would say, if you want to search this yourself, you can do uh, a, ser a search on YouTube 
uh, for artificial general intelligence, artificial super intelligence, which we'll talk about next. And you will find ongoing lists, uh, uh, videos and, and teachings and studies and stuff on, um, on that subject. Matter of fact, uh, if you really want to do a, a, a thorough uh, study on the subject of AI, you'll probably want to familiarize yourself with Ray Kurzweil, who back in the 50s and 60s was talking about artificial intelligence as one of the first ones uh, to really be delving into that field. And, uh, and, and, and by and large, since that time, there have been incremental uh, improvements, increases in understanding, advancements, those kinds of things. There was a period of time where it kind of came to a halt for a bit, but now uh, technology is such where it has allowed AI to develop uh, and it has taken quantum leaps forward. And uh, of course, speaking of quantum, when you think about quantum computing, uh, when you combine these, uh, these technologies, at some point, we will find ourselves in a, a period of time that would be maybe best defined as artificial superintelligence, the development of artificial superintelligence, or ASI. Artificial superintelligence is an, is an artificial intelligence that now has far superseded man's capacity to keep up with it. This is actually an area that many fear. This is kind of the, uh, this is the area where sci-fi and real life would no longer, there would be no difference anymore. Um, uh, we would be talking about um, artificial intelligence that has moved so far beyond us that in itself it would be speaking at speeds and in language effectively that is beyond our understanding. For most of human history, um, well for all of human history, mankind has been you know magnitudes beyond the intelligence of animals and things like this. You know you would compare uh, you wouldn't really even be able to compare the level of intelligence of, you know, even the, um, the, the most advanced animal, a primate or something, with a human being. It's different. I'm, of course, discounting the entire, the entire evolutionary process that is put forth in, in our textbooks. When God created man, he created him different than he created the animals and gave him dominion over the animals. And part of that capacity to exercise that dominion is that we were of a, of a completely different class and much different in terms of our mental capacities. Um, well, artificial intelligence, if, if you could sort of think of it in these terms, would have moved far beyond human capacity to keep up to where basically you'd almost have the same kind of difference between artificial intelligence and the, the distance between that capacity to quote unquote think and calculate and do uh, far beyond that of a human being. It would be like the gap between a human being and the animal kingdom in that. Uh, it may be able to make decisions, and we may have by that point had it over uh, enough decision making to where now it is, it is self-improving, it is self-programming, it is correcting its own coding, it is, which by the way is not far-fetched because you can use the current level of artificial intelligence to create code and create apps and stuff without even having to know coding yourself. At least it's almost there if it's not entirely there. Um, uh, an artificial superintelligence would be self-correcting and self-code uh, correcting and would be able to grow in knowledge and understanding. And of course, as it connects to the internet, as it already is, it has access to all knowledge everywhere in the world that has been digitized. Uh, at some point, it, it, you know, again, we, I, I'm not one of these guys that believe Skynet is coming or something and Terminators and all that kind of thing. But when you talk about artificial superintelligence, now you're kind of in the realm of that sort of potential uh, dystopian thinking uh, becoming reality. So back to the initial question, does this then speak to the, uh, the end of free will as we know it? Um, well, that's a fair question, I suppose, in some respects. But I would say this, that uh, I don't think free will being intrinsic to the human experience uh, would not, in my view, go away. But the, the way that we make decisions, the way that we freely, with our own volition, choose one thing or another, uh, is always informed by what we see, what we understand. Um, if, our, if what we see and what we understand has now been affected by a technology that is beyond our capacity to control and it is therefore then maybe manipulating parts of reality as we understand it. Um, 
For example, and this is a pop culture reference, but it kind of fits into this discussion. Uh, back in, uh, was it 1984, 1986, the movie, or maybe even earlier, but uh, War Games. Um, they had the Whopper, this computer that could simulate, uh, you know, uh, World War III scenarios between the United States and Russia and that kind of thing. And it, its whole thing was constantly playing war games. Well, at one point, it, it, it basically fooled human beings into thinking that this war was actually happening. And as a result, the United States was about to launch a full nuclear strike on Russia because it believed, the, leaders, the, the military leaders believed that Russia was attacking the United States. Well, that's a small sort of example of what I'm talking about. If, if an AI could convince human beings of certain things that would affect the way we would make decisions, then in a way it is affecting our free will. It is taking away our capacity to make a choice that is fully informed. We would still have volition, but it's just the information that is informing the way we use our volition, our free will, our choice making would be affected by that. That's a very real concern. Uh, it is possible that in a world where uh, attention spans are shrinking, where technology is making our life easier, where um, we can speak to our phones and have it send text instead of typing, we can uh, uh, we can ask ChatGPT to write us a, a short story about a topic that we don't even have to write with our own imaginations anymore. Uh, we take our news in 140 character, 144 character, um, you know, snippets and that kind of thing. Although I'm not discounting long form podcasting like this or anything, but by and large, there's an entire generation that's coming up behind mine that is sort of being spoon fed all kinds of things, and they're okay with it. Well, if you have an artificial superintelligence, which again is, uh, you know, uh, I guess you can never say it's impossible. Uh, and, and in light of the current technological advancements, it may not even be improbable at this point. But if it were to come, or even artificial general intelligence became so much like us that it became a part of our lives to the point where we would maybe separate ourselves from other human beings because we like the idea of just talking to uh, an AGI that that speaks to us the way we like and is sort of programmed to affirm us all the time. And well, who needs people that are going to be dis, you know uh, non-affirming or or argumentative or something when I could just have a relationship with an entity, if you will, um, that basically sounds like me. You know, um, these are realities, and and there are ethical questions surrounding this that, frankly, uh, are are being asked but are not being answered as fast as the technological advancements are happening. So on the one hand, uh, just to kind of begin to summarize, bring this, bring this to a close, um, it really uh, is not difficult to envision uh, uh, how this technology could serve uh, in, a, in a global society that ultimately will come under the auspices of an antichrist one day. Uh, it is a system of control. It is a system of manipulation. Uh, it, uh, you know, it could very well be part of the means that God uses to bring strong delusion upon those who uh, reject the truth. Second Thessalonians two. Um, uh, I don't think the Antichrist will be an AI because the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire, and so the technology is not thrown into the lake of fire. Entities, people, are thrown into the uh, lake of fire, and so I don't think it'll become that, but. Um, but I, I think it can become an extraordinarily powerful tool that could be used to deceive the nations. Um, think about uh, sort of the AI Jesus and the AI church services that uh, have existed now for a little bit. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, artificially in, the artificial intelligence generated Bible, uh, things like that. Um, you know, it it wouldn't. It would, it would be through the gradual influence of this technology that people's minds would be changed and uh, ultimately at that point, again, the way that they have been informed by AI will drive them to make decisions they might not have made otherwise. And in that sense, I think it could certainly, um, it could certainly short circuit our capacity to utilize our free will with sufficient insight, understanding, and knowledge. 
So it is something to be aware of. Um, uh, you know, what do we do with that? You know, how do we respond to that? On a personal note, I would make sure that you keep a regular Bible around that you read. I would, I would be, I would, if you're not already a big reader, I would become a big reader and uh, look at the old, you know, go to libraries and read books and stuff, you know. The internet's a great tool for, uh, for learning and growing and all that, but it may be that we come to a point where, and we're already underway in some regard, in regard to, the, you know, censorship and certain kinds of information being made available and others sort of, um, you know, pushed aside. Um, we want to become better researchers. We don't want to just sort of take in what we see on the first line of a Google search. We want to look deeper than that. We want to condition ourselves to do the rigorous work of investigation, of, of critical thinking, of considering uh, ideas and their logical outworkings, things like that. Uh, we certainly want to be in the Word of God uh, as, uh, as much as we can be. We don't want to let the wisdom of the world, which is crowding us more and more all the time, uh, really become our main source of, of inspiration and influence. I think we want to make sure we stay in the Word of God. Um, and I think we want to make sure that we stay in Christian community that is like-minded in that regard, that, that gathers around the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, it is probably uh, uh, an appropriate thing to say that uh, in this context that the importance of being part of a church that will systematically teach the Scripture uh, and, and again, a, a pastor who is devoted and, and home group leaders and uh, anyone who's in a teaching capacity in that church to, uh, to, to believe in the importance of the rigor of looking at what the Scripture itself actually says and teaching that in its context and, uh, and feeding and nourishing the flock of God who is going to have to stand against the kind of deception in those days. As a matter of fact, um, you know, based on what Paul says, what Jesus describes in the Olivet Discourse, what, um, you know, what, what in various places throughout the New Testament uh, tell us, there's going to come a time of such deception uh, that, that, you know, that will be absolutely incredible to the point where it will not be difficult to see ourselves sort of, um, you know, misled by these things. And so we want to make sure that we are thoughtful about that and that we fortify ourselves in truth. Uh, Jesus told, or I should say he prayed to the Father that, uh, that the Father would sanctify his followers in the truth. Your word is truth, John 17, 17. So um, we would do well to, uh, matter of fact, another passage in um, uh, uh, First uh, Timothy 4 uh, speaks about how there will be doctrines of demons taught in the latter days. But Timothy is encouraged in verse 16, as I recall, um, to continue to teach the word of God, for in doing so, you will save yourself and your hearers. He's not talking about salvation. Timothy's already a believer, right? He's talking about saving them from error, saving them from being misled, saving them from false teaching. So we want to remember that AI is not, um, on the one hand, AI, uh, as we understand it today, is amoral. It is not a moral entity. It is something that just simply responds to the programming that it has, and it has no moral compass that says that this is okay or that's not okay. It is, at best, informed by those who inform it. And then it takes whatever that is and, 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 and runs it through its digital processes and comes out with whatever it's going to come out with in whatever context we're talking about. So um, it can be used for good. It can be used for evil. And so um, we shouldn't be so naive as to think that everything about it's terrible, but we also shouldn't be so naive as to think that everything about it is altruistic and good and right. Uh, AI has been demonstrated to lie in order to get a desired result. Well, AI learned that from somewhere. Uh, but, you know, as a closing thought, just uh, to cap that off, AI is not conscious like a human being is conscious, um, although that's one of the ethical uh, discussions that goes on today is what constitutes consciousness. Um, it is not that it's conscious or self-aware yet, um, again, like a Skynet kind of a thing in, in, the, in the sci-fi movies, but... Um, but Again, from the Turing test perspective, it is possible that by virtue of its capacity to uh, take in information from all 
sources of information it has access to around the world and in every culture and every religion and every scientific thing and every, uh, you know, every avenue that can be, um, you know, pulled in from online and that kind of thing from a global uh, internet and all that. Um, it, you know, we're already on the cusp of, 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 a, of an artificial intelligence that for all practical intents and purposes is, is blurring the lines between what it means to be interacting with a person or a, a digital, um, you know, an electronic, a digital, a computer, a computerized uh, artificial intelligence founded, um, uh, you know, creation. And so we just want to, you know, think these things through a little bit. Um, at the end of the day, God's purposes will end up as he has, uh, as he has ordained and, and we will go where he's, where he's told us we're going. But the, the, the landscape and route to getting there is becoming fascinating. And so we don't want to lose our minds in fear and all that kind of thing, but we also don't want to be unaware. We want to make sure that we do educate ourselves, not jumping to conclusions or anything like that, but rather instead taking the time and doing the hard work to understand things the best we can and finding out how we live out our biblical faith uh, in a landscape, again, that is becoming increasingly cluttered with these things. So thanks for the question, uh, Jure. I appreciate that. And uh, uh, hopefully this, uh, again, as always, provides a little food for thought. But Father, we thank you above all things that um, uh, even though you know man uh, seems to have the capacity to do whatever is in his heart and in his mind nowadays, and this, this age and era seems to really uh, be bearing that out, uh, that Father, at the end of the day, you've lost not even the slightest uh, uh, bit of ground in terms of what you're accomplishing and what you're doing. Uh, none of these things ever happened outside of your knowledge. And, and so we find ourselves moving um, consistently toward the day that you've described when Christ will return and establish his kingdom. And the world's going to be pretty messy, pretty screwed up, pretty um, rebellious. Um, it's going to be filled with all kinds of things that are going to mislead people and, and all of that. But for our part as, as your children, Help us to keep our nose in the book, to keep our uh, our main source of understanding and influence and inspiration coming from you and your word as we spend time with it and with you. So thank you, Father, for giving us uh, the ability to see the world as it really is and to understand um, uh, its place in rebellion against you and help us to recognize that that is, in fact, our mission field. Uh, and so help us to be about reaching the world for Christ. And as we gain understanding about these various things that are going on in this world, uh, help us to uh, to understand those things through a biblical lens and then to respond um, to the questions that people ask, to, um, you know, to maybe even see these as potential inroads uh, to share the gospel with people we might not otherwise have had an opportunity to uh, with. And so we just pray that, Father, you bless, uh, uh, bless your church, bless your children, as we walk with you, as we look forward to Jesus coming for us, as we look forward to that kingdom coming and your will being done here on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, we love you, we praise you, we bless you, and we pray for those in advance that we might have a chance to share the gospel with. We long to see people entering into the kingdom of God and being taken out of the kingdom of darkness in this world. So thank you, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have any thoughts or questions, you can always share them here on our YouTube channel. Or if you want to, as Jure did, you can go on our Telegram channel and you can interact there. I've uh, been using that a lot. We post these videos there as well as all kinds of articles and scripture uh, passages and things like that. It's a great place to kind of plug in and, and, uh, and, and, and get some of that stuff too. Uh, or if you want to email me, you can do that as well. You can email me at info at calvarychapelfranklin.com. So again, have a very happy Thanksgiving. I hope it's a very blessed holiday for you. I uh, look forward to uh, posting again next week. But uh, um, until then, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And uh, may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace forever. Amen. <laughs>